yeah. Victoria made this presentation, so if I'm a little bit awkward, <laughs> that's why I didn't make this presentation. But um, so I guess, yeah, you all could probably help in a number of ways. We'd love for you to get involved generally in our mutual aid network, um, but even just donating produce or helping out like with the labor of the gardens that we um, start um, that we start soon, like anything would be much appreciated, but here is, oh, okay. so yeah, a quick overview, like I said, uh, building solidarity between neighbors and providing basic needs like food, clothing, household, ha household goods, and like services where that's needed. Um, we have a Facebook group that eventually we want it to sort of be like a, almost like a barter <laughs> location. <laughs> so people can say, oh, you know, I need my car fixed and, someone is able to fix car but that person might need food for the week and you know so solidarity economy building relationships building community and helping out um, with short-term needs also which is what we've been doing mostly with our pantry and our weekly outreach um, is kind of just helping out with these immediate short-term needs that there are a lot of organizations that also do this but they require means testing a lot and people always talk about all the hoops they have to jump through to get just a box of food um, occasionally it's really difficult so what we do is we have a survey people fill it out and someone reaches out to them and on Mondays we deliver food and we go to the grocery store and pick it out especially for them so um, so far we've been running on donations and um, like donations of pantry items and um, fundraiser donations that we take to the grocery store, but it would be amazing to be able to be more sustainable and more um, financially sustainable to like have produce that's locally grown and it's also a lot healthier than what we have to get in the store. So that's, um, that would be really great. And I forgot to mention we have a trailer that we're operating out of right now because um, we had a pantry space in the DSA headquarters on West Market, but they have a plumbing problem, so we couldn't stay there. And so we bought a trailer that we have parked at someone's house right now, but eventually we want to go mobile and like invite people to come into the trailer, pick out what they need instead of um, picking it out for them and going out. So yeah, donating produce would be really helpful. Um, so like dedicating a raised bed or a few plants to bring to us on Mondays, or we could even pick them up if that would work better. And here's some other ways to get involved. So like I said, every Monday we do outreach and delivering boxes is we have like a few drivers, about five or six every Monday, starting at 1230 that we um, that go out to people's houses and do contact lists, drop off. And recently in light of the um, ordinances and like articles about uh, against the houseless community. We've started a sort of subcommittee side project type thing called uh, take out the real trash, like um, gentrifiers, um, you know, corrupt business owners, etc. And that meets Saturday evening, um, Saturday evenings at 630 in the breezeway. And that's um, something that we're also using as a resources outreach Thing. We're taking um, requests from the houseless members and kind of suiting their or um, helping them out with their needs as well. So yeah, we have a Facebook page, uh, we have a Discord server, and we do occasional pantry and clothing drives at the local projects um, thrift store. And I can post our website in the chat if I can find the chat. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop my screen share because that's pretty much all I had to say. So if that was a little bit choppy. Um, but yeah, our website shows a lot of the stuff that we've been able to do um, in the past year and it's a good central location. It also has our a way you can email if you want to get involved. <clears throat> um, so Claire, so folks want to bring you produce like Sunday or Monday would probably be best or yeah um probably Monday is when we're at the trailer there's usually someone yeah. there from about 11 maybe even <clears throat> earlier than that until about 
two or three. So um, you could directly contact us. We could send you the address for that. And, um, or yeah, someone could come by and pick it up. I mean, we live in different places and I'm sure one of us could come by and just, you know, pick up a box of produce. Okay. And um, I'll share your um, PowerPoint with folks afterwards. So okay. um, folks can have that contact info. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much. And does anyone have any questions or anything before she hops off? It's Tri-Cities, um, Tennessee, Virginia, Mutual Aid Network. I'll type it in the chat. Um, and yeah, we have a Facebook group that, and we have a Facebook page and a Facebook group on the page. We usually post like um, our meetings, the link to join our Zoom meetings. And the group is more of a, a resource hub sort of for people that are local. Cool. All right. Um, thank you so much, Claire. And yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, and for being have a good night. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Cool. All right. Um, okay. So I'm going to get rolling with our presentation for the evening. So let's see. Can everyone see this? Rosie, anybody? Yes. Great. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Planting your garden is our topic for the tonight. So I'm going to go over um, a bunch of different topics. Um, and but at first, I guess I just wanted to give some space. Um, if folks wanted to. Uh, if, if folks had any questions about the garden plants or plant orders, um, if you could just type it out into chat um, and then we'll kind of, um, just for the sake of time, um, you, you can type it out and we'll cover it at the end when I see what everyone has questions about because maybe there'll be some repeats and stuff. And then um, for folks that don't have any questions, they can pop off um, from the from the presentation. So. Um, please go ahead and, and type out any questions or if you want to do it over email, um, you know, feel free to email Rosie and myself. Um, although it would be nice to just answer them tonight if we can at all possible. Um, and then just a reminder about our pickup date on Thursday, April 22nd, which is the big reason why you need to get your plant orders uh, into us as soon as you possibly can, if you haven't already. Um, because we are going to be handing out seeds and plants, uh, hopefully the plants, on um, next Thursday. And we will also, it's going to be a probably the biggest supply um, distribution of the year, but we'll also be doing fertilizer. Uh, we'll be handing out a couple of tools. We've got a, for the, for the new gardeners, we've got um, a trowel and a, a special hoe um, for y'all, um, and also trellising materials. Um, we don't have it in the budget this year to buy returning gardeners more tea posts, but if you want more of the netting that we gave out last year, we have plenty of that. Um, so if you do want more netting, um, please feel free to request that. Um, otherwise, I think we are giving out enough tea posts and netting to do about 40 feet of trellising. And I'm gonna talk about the trellising um, later in this presentation, what I mean by that. Um, so just letting you know uh, what's coming. Um, our plants um, are coming from a greenhouse in uh, North Carolina, and I should, they should, um, we're going to have them shipped. <laughs> so they should be here Wednesday for a Thursday distribution, um, if all goes well. <laughs> um, and, oh, and everyone will get another bag of fertilizer. Sorry, my toddler is crying. I'm sorry, Buster. Hey, bud. Hold on. <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, everyone will be getting a, another bag of fertilizer. Um, this is um, 
a 50 pound bag of really awesome organic fertilizer. So um, everyone will get that and you should get your seeds and the plants that you order um, from your crop plants. Okay, all right. What we're gonna talk about tonight is um, planting your garden. So I'm gonna talk about preparing your soil and your, and your garden beds for planting, um, the items you're gonna need. I'm gonna go through a very detailed discussion about how to plant seeds and plants because I know some folks are brand new to this whole adventure. Uh, so I just kind of want to lay it out for you as clear as I can. Um, a little some fertilizing advice. Um, talk about preventing weeds from growing in your garden. Um, we'll talk about watering and irrigation, and then we'll talk some about the trellising. So um, in case my voice totally um, dies on me before I'm able to finish, and also um, this is kind of like the number one thing I have to tell you. And if you learn nothing else this from this program this year, um, I want you to learn to keep your soil covered at all times. Um, and this means using mulch, compost, landscape fabric, cardboard, tarps, whatever. Um, and we'll talk a lot in the August workshop about cover crops and how beneficial those are. That's probably the most beneficial thing you can do is if you don't have a, um, um, a plant that you're gonna eat growing in your garden, in a spot in your garden that you should be growing cover crops in that spot um, if there's gonna be any kind of uh, delay in between plantings. So, but I will talk a lot more about that in August. Um, and so anyway, I'll talk more about covering in a few slides from now, but this is, this is my number one advice and it's something I'm gonna talk about in every workshop, but to just really try to hammer it home <laughs> to y'all because <laughs> it's the number one thing I can tell you to do in your garden, keep it covered. Okay, so <clears throat> soil preparation. Um, I talk about raised beds or raising up your planting areas a lot. And so this is a kind of, this is um, a picture of what that looks like. So this is actually my garden plot um, last year and um, it was freshly tilled. And so I went through with a shovel and dug out my walkways um, and piled that soil into, a, into the planting area. So I have designated walking and planting areas. And I actually didn't need to till this year um, because you know I was taking care of, of the soil and so it didn't become compacted at all over the growing season. So it's actually um, easy to plant in this year that, so I don't need to retill the garden. Um, and that's what I really wanna get you all to, not only um, because tilling is, you know, hard to do just like from a labor perspective, but it's also really um, destructive on the soil. So the less tilling uh, we can do, the better off your, the healthier your soil is going to be. So, um, uh, so we'll talk more, especially in the August workshop about no-till, but there's things you can start doing now to kind of get yourself to, to a no-till garden. Um, if you, so if you do, if um, I know my husband buddy went through and tilled like 20 gardens over three days. Um, but if you didn't request tilling um, or you're planning to do tilling, just some tips on that. You want to till when um, it's dry. You don't want to till after it's rain and rained and you really want to wait three or four days after a good rain for the soil to dry out. Um, otherwise, uh, you'll do even more damage to the soil structure if you till while it's still wet. And one way you can tell if it's dry enough um, is if you take some soil uh, from the ground and you squeeze it, if it kind of crumbles when you let go, that means it's dry enough. If it still kind of um, clumps together, um, then it's not dry enough uh, for you to till. So you want to see some crumbly dry soil before you till. Um, so again, another benefit to this um, raising up of the soil, it helps with drainage, it reduces compaction, it really has a lot of benefits. So, um, and it wasn't that much work, I will say, especially if you do it immediately after you till so that the soil doesn't have any time to settle uh, and, and become a little more compacted if you till and then get out there. Um, and I did, a, this is probably about a 25 by 30 um, garden and I did it in an afternoon and it really wasn't all that much work. Um, so, um, you know, if you can get out there with a couple shovels and, and, and your family, you can make good work of it. And you can, I just did it, I just eyeballed it. Um, but if you really are into straight lines, um, you can 
measure it out at either end and put stakes in and put line string up um, between the stakes so that you can have a straight line. Um, I'm not a straight line person, so <laughs> it doesn't bother me to have slightly crooked beds, but um, that's one way to, to get nice straight beds if that's your jam. So where are we? Are you gonna turn? Here we go. Okay, so for planting, um, and again, I don't mean for this to be um, painfully obvious, but I just know that some folks, again, have never gardened before. And so I really just wanna go start from the very basics um, and just make sure that everyone is on the same page. So when you're getting ready for planting, you're gonna need your seeds or plants, obviously, um, some fertilizer. This is not a picture of the fertilizer that we're handing out. This is just a random bag of fertilizer I found in my basement when I need to take a picture. Um, and you'll need something to plant the plants with either a hand trowel or a small shovel or something. You don't want a, like a big regular sh size shovel. It's gonna be too big um, for these baby plants. And then you're gonna need um, your water source ready to go. So <clears throat> um, planting seeds. So for larger seeds like peas, beans, corn, squash, beets, anything that um, is you know, pretty hefty for a seed, uh, you could actually soak to help speed up germination. Um, don't soak, you can soak overnight if you're planning to, to, to plant in the morning, but you don't wanna soak them too long because seeds actually do need some oxygen. And so if you leave them in the water for, for you know, more than a day, really, um, you run the risk of drowning your seeds and so they won't germinate at all. Um, but a little bit of soaking kind of helps um, um, soften the seed, the exterior of the seed, and kind of wakes the seed up so that it's it's ready to sprout faster. Um, so I don't always um, soak, but it does help um, things come up a little sooner. Um, I also will try to coordinate planting days um, before it's going to rain. Um, so if I see in the weather forecast that there's a really good chance of rain and, or it looks like there's a big storm coming our way, I'll rush out and plant stuff just so that it, it has that nice soaking rain um, to, to help it sprout. Um, for me, the easiest, this is my method of planting seeds. So I like, if you'll see in this picture, I like to just create a trench for seeds um, down you know, whatever space in the row I'm gonna gonna be planting in. So I'll use the trowel or I'll use a hoe or something um, to just create a long trench. And then, um, so then it's kind of mostly straight. Um, again, you can use string or um, some, you know, some other thing to help you get a straight line if you really need it. And then I like to put the fertilizer right in the trench um, with the seeds. Um, I don't like to broadcast fertilizer over the whole row because I think that's a good way to just fertilize your weeds. Um, so I like to put it fertilizer right in the trench or right in the planting hole for the plants just so that the fertilizer is getting to um, uh, the plant where it needs to be and not feeding your weeds. So um, <clears throat> you don't need to fertilize um, beans and peas. Anything in the legume family um, doesn't doesn't want fertilizer, so don't worry. So this is a picture of peas. There's no um, fertilizer in there, but um, sorry, I'm going to mute that. Um, so anyway, uh, and then you want to a good rule of thumb for planting seeds is that you should plant a seed two to four. Um, seed length depth into the soil so how if you, so bigger seeds are going to go down deeper into the soil and smaller seeds are going to stay more towards the surface okay um, so that's a pretty good rule of thumb is to plant big seeds a little deeper up to an you know big seeds can go up to an inch below the surface of the soil and small seeds should probably stay you know within a quarter inch of the surface so really just kind of scratched into the surface of the soil um, for small seeds so that's just kind of a rule of thumb um, seed packets will tell you um, a little more information about how deep to plant it and I'll talk about that in a second we also have a couple um, of questions um, just okay. okay so Becky wants to know if she can use her fertilizer from last year Great question. And um, yes, it's just going to have less nitrogen in it than it says on the bag because nitrogen um, is fairly volatile and will escape into the atmosphere. But it should have um, similar amounts of um, phosphorus and, and potassium and, and any of the other things on it because those are more stable minerals um, in it. So 
the thing about buying or getting new fertilizer is um, is the nitrogen and, and nitrogen is really important for most plants. Um, so if you wanted, I mean, you're going to get another bag of fertilizer, but um, if you want to use what you haven't, what you have left over, you may want to mix in um, like some so a, a source of nitrogen, like a little bit of blood meal or feather meal, um, something like that, which you can usually get from like um, a, a garden supply store or, or a big box hardware store or something like that. We usually have some sort of nitrogen source uh, that you want to mix in just so that um, that you, you're getting that into your, your fertilizer. But yes, you can reuse it. And um, then one other, um, how deep should the walking paths be dug? Or like a um, or... Yeah, so when you till, um, one of the one of the problems with tilling is that um, the tines only go down so far, so they maybe only go down six inches or something, and then wherever the tines stop, um, you cut the the soil kind of creates a hard pan so it gets compressed um, and if you till over and over and over again that hard pan becomes um, impermeable to water um, but the upshot is when you're doing it this way um, you're, you're basically your shovel is going to hit that kind of harder area of ground that where the tines haven't reached so that's really as deep as you, you should just get whatever you can um, so it probably is, depending on the size of your tiller, four to six inches um, down, and you'll hit untilled soil, basically, um, and you'll know. <laughs> Any other questions? Does that answer that? I, I mean, you could probably dig into that deeper, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna be easy or uh, particularly fruitful. Yeah, I think that's it for now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so uh, there are a couple of different ways of seeding things. If you can see in this picture, I've kind of spaced these, these are peas. Um, I've spaced them out uh, to close to their final um, mature. They're basically at the mature seed planting sp spacing. Um, there are folks that will just sprinkle like the whole packet down down the row um, and then come back after things have germinated and and thin it out. Um, to me, this feels like both a waste of seeds because um, you're just you're going to be killing, you know, two thirds of what you what you just put out um, in order to have the right spacing. And then it's also labor, you know, you have to go back and 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 and, you know, the labor of pulling out the extra plants. So I just do a um, um, the mature seed spacing, the mature plant spacing according to the packet or um, the plant cheat sheet and just put them in there. And, you know, if I notice that something hasn't germinated after a week or so, I will go back and put more seeds in that spot. And, um, you know, it's okay if it's like a week, a week late or whatever, it, it'll be totally fine. But um, so just that, this is just my method um, of planting seeds. And so, once you have the seeds in there and your fertilizer, whatever you need to put in that, um, you know, cover it with, you know, I kind of, so it's kind of, you've dug this trench. And so I just kind of like fold the soil gently back on top of the seeds. Uh, and then um, I lightly tamp it down with the flat end of a, of a metal garden rake um, or some kind of flat surface, just kind of lightly go through and just tamp down um, so that there's good contact between the seed and the soil. And then you want to come through and water very thoroughly. Um, you want to get a good amount of water on there. Or if you're timing it, um, you know, right before raining forecast, you don't necessarily, if it seeds and it, you know it's going to rain later, or you're hoping it's going to rain later, you know, um, they can just, um, you can, you don't have to bring water in that case to them. Um, and with bigger seeds, with smaller seeds, um, like lettuce and carrots, especially, you want to be really diligent about watering. Um, with peas, I don't necessarily come out and water them. Um, I just, they just kind of sit in the soil. They're big, sturdy seeds and they will sit in the soil and they'll germinate when they germinate, um, which is usually at, right after a big rain. So, um, but for smaller seeds, um, you definitely want to water every day until they germinate. And again, one of the reasons why carrots especially are so difficult is because they can take up to three weeks to germinate. Um, so, and, and if you don't water them every day, then they definitely won't germinate. Um, so, 
if you're wanting to try carrots this year, you're going to have to get out there and water them <laughs> every day uh, until they germinate, which could be three weeks from when you plant them. So, um, and then once things do germinate, uh, you want to gradually reduce watering. Um, I would I would continue to water them daily um, until uh, for the first week or so, and then gradually reduce watering. Um, you want to really hit a goal of just watering two or three times a week. Um, and you want to water deeply when you water. I'll talk more about this later in the watering section, but um, you don't you don't want to give them a little bit of water every day. You want to give them a lot of water two or three times a week, and that really that helps the roots grow deep down into the soil and makes your plants more resilient. Okay, seed packet, a little bit about here. We also, um, Rosie and I recorded a little video about seed packets. So um, there's some more, I think she said she's gonna be uploading that video soon if she hasn't already. So um, that'll be up there for future up. reference on our, oh, great, um, on the YouTube channel. Tool too. Do what? There's the tool video as well. Oh, the tool video. Yes. I talk about my favorite hose. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, I, Rosie will email all that stuff out and um, uh, we'll get you. We're, we're trying to create more uh, YouTube content this year. Um, where's my train of thought? Okay. Seed packets. Um, so there's a ton of information on your seed packets. Um, you know, there's a little bit about when to start indoors. Um, or when it, you know, if you can start them indoors and you know when, so this is six to eight weeks before you want, you, before your transplant date. Um, I think these might be tomatoes. I don't remember anymore. Yeah, indeterminate probably means tomatoes. Um, so that's six to eight weeks before your last frost date. And so this plant, this this um, seed packet actually on the bottom here shows you when um, your target is for transplanting. So they're saying that Tennessee, you wanna do May. Um, I think if the weather looks good, you can do it or, you know, late, late in April. Um, but anyway, um, and the weather, by the way, is looking good right now, um, but we are not past the last frost date um, <clears throat> for Northeast Tennessee. So please don't put your tomatoes out. Um, if you have them already, please don't put them out until um, you, you know, next week. The, our frost date is around April 20th. Um, and so what I do on the frost date, so April 20th rolls up, and then I'm going to look at the 10 day forecast. And if that looks good, then it's safe to plant because generally we don't get frost in May. But last year we got a frost in May. I think it was May. It was almost I think it was May 14th before it was safe to plant um, summer crops outside, which is the latest in I, I think I've been gardening 10 or 11 years and that's the latest I have ever seen our frost in, in Northeast Tennessee. So it happens and it's it's not great. Um, so you just gotta keep an eye on the weather and be ready to um, protect your plants if you need to, if you get them out early. Um, <clears throat> it also gives information on seed depth. So this is, tomatoes are kind of really small seeds. So quarter inch under the soil surface, the final mature spacing three to four feet. Again, that's a little, this is assuming you don't trellis, I think, that, that this is that final spacing. So if you trellis, you can get them, I think a foot and a half is plenty. And then days to harvest. And so when you're transplanting, um, it doesn't make it clear on this, but um, this is days to harvest after transplanting. So this is days to harvest after you've already raised your plants for six weeks. Um, if for stuff that's like direct sowed, like spinach and lettuce and that kind of stuff, um, that days to harvest is from the sowing of the actual seed. Um, so anyway, that, isn't always clear, but um, you just kind of have to know if it's something you direct sow or transplant. All right, any questions about sowing seeds? Anything? I don't think so. Okay. All right, great. Um, okay, so planting plants. Um, so when you get your plants, you and you want and you're ready to plant them. So um, I guess I should have put a slide in here about caring for your plants. So if you're not immediately going to um, put your plants in the ground when we give them on Thursday, um, and they could probably hang out um, for maybe a week or two, but they're going to be in fairly small containers and they're going to get root bound pretty quickly. Um, so please plan on getting them in the ground as soon as you can. Um, 
And, but if you need to let them hang out till the weekend or for a few days, um, definitely water them every day. And I would, um, you can leave them out during the day. Um, I'd put them in a spot that gets afternoon shade um, just to, to protect them a little bit because they've been in this like sheltered greenhouse situation. Um, so just being, um, being gentle with them. <laughs> give them a full blast of sunlight, um, you know, on their first day. So just definitely water them every day. And if it gets really hot um, and, you know, check them in the evening, if they need a little more water, if it's going to get below 50 degrees at night, um, you'll want to bring them inside um, if they're still in their pots. And if they are already in your garden and it's going to get below 50 degrees, you're probably going to want to put like a little light blanket or, or cloth or a bed sheet or something over them. Or if you have um, row cover from last year, you want to use that too, um, just to protect them because tomatoes and peppers especially are very sensitive to temperatures below 50 degrees. So you just want to, you just want to keep them protected until it's going to be warm enough outside. Um, <clears throat> So you're going to need, so when you go to plant, you're going to need to know the mature plant spacing um, and the plant cheat sheet has most information for, for varieties. You can also look it up online. And then I like to pre-dig all of my holes. Um, so I will go through the whole row that I'm planting and I will dig, I will measure out my spacing. Um, usually I just get like a long, um, um, why am I blanking on this? Like a measuring measuring tape, and I'll put that on the soil, and then I'll just kind of dig my holes in um, along that, so I know exactly what my spacing is going to be. And then I'll go through and I'll put fertilizer. So you want about two tablespoons per hole um, of fertilizer. So that's about an eighth of a cup um, in each hole. And again, I like to fertilize the plants, not the weeds. So that's why I go through beforehand and put the fertilizer in. Um, so set the plant in the hole. Um, and then you want to make sure that the soil line is, you know, level um, with the base of the plant. And if you can see um, this plant that I've got in, in my hand um, in this picture, you can see that the soil, you want the soil to be level with the base of the plant with the soil line that, that it already has. Um, the only exception to this is tomatoes. Tomatoes like to be buried pretty deeply, um, but everything else is not going to be happy if you bury the the the, the crown of the plant that's sticking up from the soil. So you want to make sure that soil is covering um, the soil block um, of the plant, but not burying the base of the plant. Um, so cover it lightly with soil, but not bury it much, you know, much more than like a quarter inch down. Um, does that make sense? Let me know if that doesn't make sense. Um, tomatoes, uh, like to be buried very deeply, um, and they will actually grow roots along um, any part of the plant that is in contact with the soil. So I like to just pull off um, a couple rounds of leaves up the stalk of the plants. You know, you want to leave leaves at the top, um, but then you can just kind of dig a deep hole or dig a shallow trench and just kind of lay the plant down so that there's more of it in contact with the soil and then you can just bury the whole thing you know minus the you know the leaves at the top that are sticking out um so this will make your tomatoes happy to be buried um and then if you have eggshells um tomatoes like a lot of calcium too so um folks have good results when they if you just start saving your eggshells um for breakfast and crush those up and you just put sprinkle that into each tomato hole they'll be happy little campers um and then once your plant is in the soil you want to kind of lightly tamp down around the plant we're going to do a video about this i know it's kind of hard to talk about all this but we'll um rosie and i will record another video uh, about planting plants <clears throat> um, so we'll just kind of mention this also. You want to lightly tamp the soil down um, again, so there's good contact between the the soil block and the your native garden soil. And then again, water thoroughly, um, and then water daily to get your plants established, and then gradually decrease waterings um, to two or three times per week. And um, okay, a little bit about fertilizer. Um, so this is a picture of the bag of fertilizer we're going to have give out. It's uh, the brand is Harmony. It's a um, organic um, chicken manure based um, fertilizer. And my apologies, it definitely smells like it comes from chicken manure. It's, it's a little stinky, but it's good stuff. Um, so I wanted to talk about this. So if you go, um, I totally recommend that folks get a soil test done. 
And um, you can do this through University of Tennessee Extension. If you go to your county extension office, um, you can find out information about getting a soil test done. And I think that's really important information to just know what you're dealing with in your soil, what your pH is, what your, your nutrient levels are. Um, so if anything's really off, you can correct it. Um, but when you get your soil test back, it's going to tell you, you know, differing amounts that you need to add of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And sometimes soil tests also will do um, micronutrients like sulfur, um, magnesium, calcium, um, iron boron, little stuff like that, stuff that's very important um, from plant growth, but that you don't need in large quantities. Um, so if you do do a soil test and you do, um, if it comes back that you have a deficiency in some kind of micronutrient, so these nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium are the macronutrients and everything else is a micronutrient. Um, meaning that it's needed in very small quantities. If you have a micronutrient deficiency, holler at me and I'll take a look at it and I can tell you um, what to add, if anything. Um, so anyway, generally every year, um, folks will need to add nitrogen at the very least, because again, like I said, it's um, it, it tends to off gas back into the atmosphere. So um, it, even from the soil, your soil is basically exhaling nitrogen. Um, so you need to add, definitely need to add nitrogen every year. And then um, a lot of times our soils are deficient in phosphorus. So you'll need to add some of that. And actually around here, I see a lot of times folks have an abundance of potassium. And so they don't need to actually add any more potassium to the soil. Um, so if that's, if you do a soil test and that's the case, um, you know, holler at me and we can discuss that also. But for the most part, adding a, a kind of a gentle balanced organic fertilizer, um, such as Harmony is just kind of good practice. Um, so these macronutrients, i.e. the nutrients that, that are needed in the most quantities are um, nitrogen and that's for leaf growth, um, phosphorus for root growth, and then potassium um, is for anything with a fruiting body. So a tomato or pepper or even a, you know, a squash, that's, that's the fruit of the plant and, and, and those utilize um, potassium the most. So um, that's kind of the basics of it. And then um, that number on the bag, that 543, represents a percentage. So this fertilizer is 5% nitrogen, 4% phosphorus, and 3% potassium by weight. Um, so knowing that, that it's in percentages, if you get a lot of the soil tests come back and they are in conventional, um, so it'll often be different numbers. Uh, and so you can do a little math. Um, basically, so if it tells you you need to add if the soil test says you need to add one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet, that's often what it'll say, something like that. Um, and your your fertilizer that we give out is 5% nitrogen, then you can divide one pound total of nitrogen by 5%. If you divide that, you get 20 pounds. So that's how much fertilizer you need to add 20 pounds of Harmony um, fertilizer to your soil in order to get one total pound of nitrogen to your soil. Um, because it's because 20 pound because it, the harmony is 5% nitrogen. Okay, that I know is um, a little complicated, but it just kind of helps knowing this if you um, buy a different bag of fertilizer with different amounts of nutrients in it, or you get the soil test and you want to try to convert to see how much harmony or whatever other kind of fertilizer you need to add to your soil. Okay, any questions about that? I think that is. Okay. Um, oh, co-op has soil tests for 10 bucks. Great. Yeah. Um, and there's online labs that you can send it off to that are even cheaper. Um, UT is a little expensive. It's $20 a test. Uh, it's, however, it's just really easy to do. And I'm sure co-op, the co-op, the farmer's co-op in Jonesboro is also probably pretty easy. So, and it's cheaper if you want to go there. Um, or actually, I think there's farmers co-ops in every county, not just, I just was thinking of the one in Washington County because that's where I live. But wherever you are, there's probably a farmers co-op. Um, or you can call your extension agent and see if they know of a cheaper option. And they, they won't mind to tell you, they don't care. Um, okay, so um, let's say your soil test comes back really wacky and you're way off on a certain nutrient. Um, and but your other levels are fine and you don't want to over 
you don't want to add too much of stuff that you don't need. Um, you these are just a list of and this this is going to be in the um, folder um, on the Google Drive. So you'll be able to access um, this slide afterwards. And so if you want to look reference this, um, but basically there's sources of direct sources of nitrogen, like alfalfa meal, blood meal is a I've I've seen blood meal a lot in like at Lowe's and at um, like mice and evergreen. So it's pretty accessible. I've occasionally I see feather meal. Um, sometimes you can find fish meal too. Fish meal is a good one because it usually um, contains other um, good nutrients in it too. Cotton feed meal is also a nitrogen source. However, it's very acidic. So it would be a good one if you wanted to put it on like blueberries or like rhododendrons and azaleas, any kind of plant that really wants a lot of acidity um, and also needs nitrogen. Cotton seed meal would be a good one for that. But I wouldn't use cotton seed meal in just a general situation it's going to be too acidic. Um, phosphorus bone meal is probably the most readily available one. Um, and then rock phosphate um, is a rock mineral source. Um, that's very slow releasing because you're basically just adding rock dust powder to your garden. Um, whereas the bone meal is going to decay pretty quickly and be accessible to your plants. The rock phosphate may take a few years to actually adjust your um, um, phosphorus levels in your soil. Um, potassium, potassium is a little harder. Um, if you um, truly have a weird potassium deficiency, and again, most of the time I see a lot of potassium in our soils. If you truly have a weird potassium deficiency on our soil test, holler at me and we talk about getting, um, getting more potassium into your soil. Um, but I don't normally see that, so. Uh, okay, assuming you're just gonna use our fertilizer um, on the bag, oh, it on. says- oh, There's okay. a question. Um, Karis asked, can't you use fish water like from a tank as a good nitrogen source or urine? What about cow manure com compost tea? Um, so anytime you're gonna use something that's not composted, you're going to run in, especially on food plants, you're going to run into um, issues with pathogens. So um, if you're going to use any kind of animal byproducts um, that doesn't come in a bag, um, then you want to, um, you want to be careful about not getting it, not touching the part of the plants that are going to be eaten, right? Um, and so I, I know I've seen folks that are very into hue manure, H-U manure, hue manure, human manure, um, and, but that needs, you know, anything like that, any kind of urine, any kind of fresh um, uh, um, feces needs, really needs to sit in a compost pile for, you um, I'd say at least 120 days before I would introduce it to any kind of um, plant that you're going to eat part of it. Now, if it's if it's totally ornamental um, and you really want to go pee out in your garden, you know, go pee on your azaleas, I guess. <laughs> Sorry if that upsets people, but um, uh, that's fine. But for food plants, I'd be really, really careful about introducing um, waste products especially human waste products into your food supply. So um, if you really want to, you can Google human manure and get into that. Um, I've met some folks that were really into it, but um, yeah, any kind, but that e even like cow manure or, um, or rabbit manure or chicken manure, anything really, you're going to want to let it compost, you know, 90 to 120 days um, just to kind of let the, pathogens die out of it um, but definitely and I guess with the other with that you not you don't know exactly how much um, nitrogen you're adding into the soil um, with those kind of sources too because they're not tested so fertilizer is really um, you know you, you're you know what you're adding you know how much nitrogen if you do a soil test you know how much you need and then with the fertilizer you know how much you're adding so um, <clears throat> but obviously um, you know we grew food for thousands of years uh, with just using manure. So it's obviously a, a, a valuable resource in your garden. I would just how be much, careful with it. Yeah. How much fertilizer did you say per planting hole? Yeah, so I'm about to talk about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> so 
um, with the Harmony, which the bag says to use six to eight pounds per 100 square feet, um, a pound, I weighed this out, is about two and a half cups of Harmony fertilizer. So you're going to want 15 to 20 cups per 100 square feet, which comes out to about two tablespoons per square foot. Um, so if you, uh, most, a lot of plants are going to be around the foot spacing. Um, so um, if you're going to pack, if you're, if, if it's going to be a smaller plant like lettuce or spinach or something, and you're going to put more per um, square foot, then more plants per square foot, then you can kind of spread that two tablespoons out between the square foot because it doesn't really need more than that. Um, so, but if it's like a tomato, I would definitely put the full two tablespoons into that planting hole for it. Um, again, scatter over the whole garden. Um, just feed the plants. Um, does that answer your question? And then, so you don't need to fertilize legumes. So that's peas and beans. And um, I guess there's a few kind of odd things that maybe if you open up the Baker Creek catalog or something, you might find some weird um, legumes that aren't necessarily a pea or a um, bean. Um, so you don't need to fertilize anything in that family um, because they fix their own nitrogen and they actually prefer being in kind of poor soil. Um, so. And then you don't need to fertilize anything that is a root vegetable. Um, well, you don't need to add nitrogen to anything that's a root vegetable. So any kind of beet, carrots, um, potatoes, sweet potatoes, turnips, parsnips, anything along those lines, adding nitrogen is actually going to produce um, very small roots because nitrogen again feeds the leaves. And so if you put too much nitrogen into the soil, those plants are gonna take it and they're gonna grow very leafy, beautiful tops and they're gonna have very tiny roots underneath. Um, root vegetables love phosphorus. So um, if you do want to add something to the soil, if your soil is kind of poor and you, you feel like you need to add something, then I would get um, bone a bag of bone meal. And um, that's um, a lot that has a lot of phosphorus and has a very tiny amount of nitrogen in it. Um, and so that will help your root crops grow nice and strong. So you could put a couple tablespoons um, in each planting hole for a root vegetable, um, bone meal that is. So, but that's a little complicated. If you have any questions about this, just email me. Um, but basically just add a little bit of comp or a little bit of um, fertilizer to every hole or every seed trench that you're doing. Okay, um, any other questions about that before we transition to a new topic? No. Oh, wait. My kid said human manure. E manure. Yeah, it's a little, <laughs> it's not for the faint of heart, I guess, but there are some true diehards out there. Um, can you use compost as soil? Um, so, straight compost. Uh, doesn't hold on to water very well. And so you, if you're using straight compost, you are going to basically be out there watering twice a day in order to get, otherwise your plants are just going to shrivel up from lack of water. Um, so I would definitely, I really prefer a like 50-50 compost topsoil mix if you're going to be using raised beds or, um, and this is going to be a lot more expensive, but um, if you can also do, um, if you'll look up the square foot gardening um, raised mix so that is like compost um um what's that it compost a little bit of perlite and then it's um why am i blanking on this word um not coconut coir but the other stuff anyone i'm like my brain just like totally left me um Peat moss. peat moss. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Why? I just, I don't know. I don't know where my brain went. Peat moss. So it's peat moss, perlite and compost. Um, so we're basically making potting soil for a raised bed, but no, I would not just do straight compost. Um, I mean, it looks nice and you can, you know, once you have a good soil compost mix in a raised bed, um, you can top it up every year with another inch or two of compost over it. That's great. Um, but I wouldn't just do it straight because it's just, it doesn't hold on to any water and it just immediately leaves the bed um, once it's in there. And so your plants are going to be constantly thirsty. That's just my, my experience with straight compost. So it needs something in there to hold on um, either the peat moss and the perlite or a topsoil mix. Um, okay. Um, so weed prevention is um, a favorite topic and 
again, this is going to come back to covering your soil. So what what is a weed? You know, and, and I hear, you know, people make the joke, it's just a plant growing in the wrong place. That's what a weed, you know, any plant that's growing where you don't want it is a weed. Um, and I think it's it's a much more interesting story than just you know, annoy, plants are not there to annoy you. They're actually serving a really particular purpose in the environment. Um, so weeds are, uh, most of the plants that we classify as weeds, the ones that we most often see in our gardens, are there to colonize and rehabilitate disturbed and damaged soil. They're there basically as the first responders in the natural world. To some kind of damage has happened in the environment and weeds are there to fix it. Um, so by preventing or reducing this damaged soil conditions, you can very effectively prevent weeds from growing in your garden because if the conditions that foster weed growth are not there, then they are not gonna come to your garden. And so what are those conditions basically? Um, it's, it's basically bare and so disturbed damaged soil is basically bare uncovered soil. Um, the only times in, if you look around the natural world and um, you know, not places that have been disturbed by humans, but if you look at a forest or you look at a, at a meadow or a field, um, you're never going to see bare soil unless something bad has happened. You know, um, there's been a, a fire, you know, in the, this example of this picture, there's a fire, a flood, a landslide, some kind of disaster has happened. And soil has become uncovered because um, otherwise you're always going to see something either growing in the soil There's, the soil is going to be completely covered in plants or it's going to be covered in like a, a you know a layer of rotting leaves like in a, under a forest or something so um, bare soil is most basically damaged disturbed soil and so these weeds are um, they're there to, to heal the soil um, and so the one thing you can do to prevent weeds is to never ever leave your soil bare or uncovered. Always have something covering your soil or something growing in your soil at all times. Um, you know, cover crops, mulches, landscape fabric, cardboard tarps, whatever, um, to prevent the ground from being bare in your, in your garden. Um, so weeds, you know, they have the ability to grow. They're very hardy plants. They grow in very poor conditions like you would see after a fire or a flood. Um, they reproduce extremely quickly. They grow very quickly. They produce an abundant amount of, of foliage. Um, there are some weeds plants that can produce 100,000 seeds per plant. Um, a lot of the common seed, weeds will do this. And so if even one, one weed comes that goes to seed in your garden, that's 100,000 new weed seeds that are just there. And a lot of these seeds will last, you know, they can stay in the environment for 20 or 30 years. And then when the conditions are right, they will sprout. And when conditions are right, that means bare soil. So you've just tilled your garden um, and, you know, it was grass. So you, you say you had a, a lawn, you had just grass there and you till and you leave it uncovered for a period of weeks. And then all this crazy stuff that's not grass pops up. And so basically those seeds were just kind of sitting in the soil waiting for damage basically to occur so that they could spring into action and, and do what they need to do. Um, but this, this crazy reproduction is to basically help them colonize bare ground and um, quickly stabilize soil to prevent further erosion and further damage um, from, you know, from the soil. So um, they just grow very quickly. They'll colonize, you know, quickly produce a lot of roots. Um, they produce a lot of plant matter, you know, they get kind of big and, and a lot of plant matter. So, and they usually die, you know, within a year or two. And so that, that plant matter then dies and um, it's lying on the soil surface and it starts to rot down. And so it helps to build up topsoil. And so this is a process. Topsoil in nature is something that can take 50 or 100 or more years for it to produce a single inch of topsoil. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of a long term process, you know, gradually taking, you know, let's say a burned area back to a full forest, you know, it's a process of several hundred years, but that these weeds are the first, the first part of that process of, of restoring the land. Um, Weeds also often, if you think about dandelions and burdock and other things, um, they have very deep tap roots and that serves another purpose, uh, not just to annoy you and, you know, that you have to dig down a foot in order to get the dandelion root out. Um, but those tap roots also, um, you know, they, they're scavenging nutrients from very, you know, far below, you know, from several feet down below the soil surface, and they're bringing it up into the plant itself so that when, again, when those leaves die and they rot down, those nutrients are brought up from deep below and they are 
are then rotting on the soil surface so that other plants can then have access to those nutrients. Um, so, I mean, in this perspective, weeds are really a beautiful part of nature. They're, they're not there to just annoy you, but, but they're responding to specific conditions that we often create in a garden setting. And so, you know, thinking about weeds in this perspective um, is going to help you um, prevent them from the beginning. And then that's going to save you a lot of time and effort, you know, in your gardening career, because no one wants to be out there in August weeding. It's terrible. Um, so just preventing them from the beginning, and you're not going to be 100%, you know, your first few years. But I think, you know, as you incorporate um, mulches and ground cover and cover crops, and all the other, you know, soil health stuff, you know, as you build up the health of your soil, you know, by following what we're trying to teach you, um, you will have fewer and fewer weeds in your garden, because you will not be fostering the conditions where weeds grow. Um, so for everyone that just had their garden tilled, um, this past week, then I totally recommend that you get something on top of that soil. I know some of you have huge, huge plots and that's not necessarily gonna be practical for you to cover it all, um, but just getting something um, over it as best you can um, is going to be your best bet. Um, that and planting out as soon as you can, um, getting something in the soil and getting the plants you want to grow in there. Uh, and then using a lot of mulch or using landscape fabric or some kind of other row cover um, or uh, soil cover um, is going to go a long way in saving you from spending hours and hours weeding, basically. Um, so that this is kind of the heart of everything I have to teach you, as I said at the beginning, is to just keep your soil covered <laughs> with something. Um, and that's going to go a long way to helping you have a happier time gardening, because I think weeding is probably the most miserable part um, of, of growing garden. So any questions on this? There is one. Um... Yeah, so any disadvantages to so soil solarization? Um, I wouldn't do it unless you have a really um, specific problem um, that's going to respond to soil solarization because you're going to basically create, um, you're basically going to, so what soil solarization is, is you, you put a, um, a clear piece of plastic on the soil and so um, that traps a bunch of heat under it and basically fries anything below it. Um, and it, so it will fry weeds that come up, um, but it's also gonna fry a lot of the soil bacteria and fungi and all the other living organisms in the soil and those first couple of inches of soil. And those are things I think you want to um, foster in your garden. You wanna, you wanna build up the life in your soil and not nuke it basically. Um, however, uh, there are specific situations, I think especially with certain um, disease pathogens um, and and we can have a longer conversation about that if you are having a specific issue with a, with diseases um, or a lot of trouble with diseases in your garden. Um, I think soil solarization um, can help wood straw. Yeah, sorry, sorry. When I say mulch, I don't mean like wood chips. And I'm gonna I have a slide on here um, about different. Um, yeah, here's when I talk about mulch, this is what I mean. So straw or old hay, be careful with hay because sometimes it can have seeds in it. Um, shredded leaves are awesome. Grass clippings are great. Grass clippings actually are a source of nitrogen. Um, if you work in an office and you have a lot of shredded paper, um, you can put shred, it looks a little funny. It looks like it snowed, um, but it's fine too. Um, any kind of other organic waste, I don't know if you, if you like homebrew or and you have like or you live next to a brewery or something and you have a bunch of like um spent grains or whatever or um, there's people who live near the coast and they use different kinds of like seaweed and stuff it's just whatever you have on hand whatever kind of organic waste material and i mean organic in the chemical sense and that it's a carbon-based life form um not certified organic um bark and wood chips actually are not all that great because they're so high in so most of the well, everything else I put here has a has a very has a balanced um, carbon to nitrogen ratio, but bark or wood chips are so high in carbon and have so little nitrogen that they actually will bind up nitrogen in your soil if they're fresh um, in the process of decomposing. So if you have bark or wood chips, um, then um, 
you, you'll want to um, let them sit for a year or two and just kind of start decomposing. So if you have a pile of wood chips that's been sitting for a year or two, that's great to mulch with. That's already starting to decompose. It's not going to not lock up nitrogen the way fresh wood chips would. Um, if you have a tarp, that's absolutely great. I would get something over your garden um, right now if it's been tilled and tarps are totally fine. Um, you know, dark opaque, something that's going to block out the light is going to be fine cardboard. Um, you have to be careful with ink from printers or using um, paper cardboard. Um, I think it's probably in such a small quantity. Um, if you are using shredded paper that's covered in ink and you're using a ton of it and you use it year after year, maybe you might run into problems. But I think on a small enough scale that the soil life is probably just going to deal with it. Um, um, I would not use tarps to plant into. I'm going to talk a little bit about what you can use in just a minute. Um, um, yeah, okay, sorry, she asked about solarization again. You have the greenhouse plastic. I, I don't know, I'd be hesitant to, to use the clear plastic. I just feel like you would fry fry things that you want rather than deal with the weeds. Um, so any, any kind of material, straw, hay, anything is probably better than nothing, but I don't know. I'll think on that one before you meet me. Um, okay, yeah, let me talk a little bit about what, what kind of materials you can. I would use a tarp to um, cover your garden before you plant, before you're ready to plant, um, but I wouldn't, plant into a tarp um, just because it's not a great material uh, to do that. But um, I will talk about what you can plant into. So um, anyway, this slide, we can just kind of gloss over. I feel like I've discussed this. There's a lot of benefits besides just um, weeds to mulching. It conserves water, um, so you, you don't have to water as much. Um, it prevents certain uh, soil-borne diseases from spreading onto plants. Um, it can provide habitat for predatory insects. Um, I know people hate spiders, but spiders are awesome to have in your garden. You want to you want to create opportunities for spiders to live in your garden um, because they will eat a lot of nasty bugs that are going to eat your plants. Um, and then as mulch decays, it also builds up soil organic matter into your into your soil. So. Um, there's a lot of reasons to mulch. So you want to use about six inches of like, if this is straw or um, rotted wood chips or something or shredded leaves, you want to use four to six inches. Um, you can spread the mulch out and then put the plants into it. Um, you know, then kind of move it out of the way a little bit and put your plant down into the mulch. Um, you, it can be a little difficult to, to to put mulch immediately on places where you've been direct sowing, because again, mulch is going to prevent weed seeds from germinating. And so if you put your seeds down and then put six inches of mulch on top of it, then your seeds are not going to germinate either. Um, so you need to wait till plants um, are, you know, maybe about six inches tall so that that when you do mulch around them, and it's a little harder to mulch around plants that are already in the ground. Um, but it's worth getting in there, at least getting something over the soil. Um, and then weeds will still emerge um, under mulch. They still find a way, especially the first couple of years, but they'll be much easier to deal with. Um, and you want to get them while they're small, when they've just popped up above the surface. You definitely don't want to let any weeds um, go to seed as much as you can prevent it from doing that. Okay, so um, I wouldn't plant in a tarp, but if you are interested, there's uh, you can get landscape fabric, and that's um, if you. <clears throat> this is used on a lot of commercial operations um, because carrying in, you know, straw or mulch or whatever on a large scale is just not practical for most, you know, farmers. So um, you can use um, certain kinds of plastic that's made for. Um, for covering the ground or um, landscape fabric is nice because most of the time, if you if you are willing to spend a little bit of money on it um, and get a, a nice quality landscape fabric, it should last you at least you know three to five years or a little longer in, in your garden. Um, and so you want to look for a kind of high quality, heavyweight fabric. Um, 
I think the best grade to use in the garden is the, is the five ounce weight. That's what I look for. And then you don't want to cut into it because then the fabric will fray. So you actually need to um, burn holes into it. And I, we, um, we, we may make a video. There's also tons of videos on YouTube already about how to burn holes um, into your landscape fabric. So um, you, you, there's a picture. This is actually kind of a little blurry picture, but um, you know, this guy has made a little jig out of plywood and he's, you know, cut holes into it. And so he's just placing that over the landscape fabric. And then he's got a little propane tank and a, and a torch. And he's basically just, you know, just you, you blast it for like not even half a second. It's really quick. Um, if you leave it on too long, you'll set the thing on fire. <laughs> so to be careful. Uh, <laughs> I definitely set it on fire the first time I tried it. But um, yeah. Yeah. Newspaper works great. Um, with newspaper, I would do several layers of it. Um, one layer may not be thick enough, um, but you know, especially newspaper combined with straw, that's gonna be awesome for sure. Um, oh, okay, you meant uh, landscape fabric. Yeah, landscape fabric is absolutely great. Um, all right, so the question, if we have raised beds and aren't planting directly into our ground soil, yes, you should, because weeds are gonna, um, weeds are probably already, if you got a topsoil mix, honestly, and it's just been sitting out, you know, at the, at the wherever it's been sitting out is if they haven't covered it and most places are not going to cover their um, topsoil compost mixes it probably has weeds in it just that got blown in or birds brought it in or something um so yes you want to mulch even in raised beds it's going to be very beneficial because you don't know it what's in that topsoil mix um and i've definitely um had some kind of bad experiences i've I had used my, my old house, I had about 14 raised beds. So I bought a lot of topsoil compost mixes from around the area. And, um, and sometimes you get some really noxious weeds that come in. Um, and, you know, you can't necessarily blame the company. It may have been, you know, some bird or pooped in the pot, you know, on it and, and introduced some seeds um, into it. And so, uh, yeah, you may get something weird. So yes, you should definitely mulch in raised beds. Um, can folks hear me? It gave me a message. <clears throat> yeah, you're good. Okay, I had an abundance of dried pine needles. Pine needle mulch is great. Um, some people will tell you that it's too acidic. Uh, from what I have read, it is not. It doesn't break down to be, it. pine trees are acidic or and thrive in acidic conditions, but pine needles don't break down and promote acidity. So yes, pine needles are a great mulch, absolutely. I'm going to move on um, and take care of any of these materials. Take care of your landscape fabric. Take care of your row cover. Take care of your trellising materials. And most of the stuff will last you, you know, four or five years in the garden. Okay, trellising. Um, trellising is a form of vertical gardening, which, you know, if you Google vertical gardening, you're going to get all kinds of like trendy, fun little projects. But um, it's basically you're just raising up your plants off the ground so that they're not in, so that the vines of the plants are not in contact with the soil. And so that's going to promote more airflow and help prevent disease, both because the leaves are drier, there's more air. So airflow helps to dry off the leaves and that helps prevent disease. And also because there's actually a lot of soil borne diseases um, that can infect your plants. And so the less plant material that is in contact with the soil, the less chance there is um, of some kind of soil borne disease uh, coming in and killing your plant. So um, this is a great technique for tomatoes, cucumbers, small melons. I would not put your, you know, you know, if you have a melon variety that's going to produce like a 20 pound watermelon, I would not try to put that one up a trellis, you're probably just gonna squash your trellis, probably just gonna rip it down once it gets big enough. Um, but like a small melon, um, you know, if it's like a two or three pound, like little cantaloupe, that can grow up a trellis fine. Um, certain kinds of squash, again, don't put put those big, big honkers on a trellis. But um, although actually I have seen sometimes um, squash especially if you have like a compost squash you know one a little plant that pops up in your compost um i've seen those run up trees like i've seen squash like growing up out of you know like the vine is up in the tree and it looks like the tree is producing squash so um if you have a sturdy enough trellis um yes you can grow squash on a trellis um, and the plant just seems to compensate by producing a thicker stem and so it seems to be able to hold you know even these giant squash up so it can be kind of amusing um 
I've seen like some cool squash tunnels, you know, if folks get cattle paneling and basically make a, a hoop out of it. And um, then they just grow, you know, it's grow their squash, you know, in a little tunnel and that's kind of cool. Um, pole beans, um, peas are also another one um, that can benefit from trellising. Uh, you want to put your trellis up and I actually Rosie and I made a video on installing trellis so that sh is that up too, Rosie. It's not up yet, but I'll be working on it. Yet. It will be soon. Um, talking about how to install the T posts and the netting that we're going to give out. Um, you want to put the trellis up uh, either before or at the same time that you're going to be planting. Um, otherwise, uh, putting the T post in can kind of disturb the plants. You don't. You want to do it <clears throat> um, before if you can. Um, and here's a picture, of basically what this is going to look like. So. Um, We're getting there. We're almost there. I'm going to make it. Um, <laughs> this is we're giving out these T posts and um, this netting. It's um, it's a lot sturdier than it looks. It's going to look like really flimsy netting. But honestly, if you um, follow our instructions for installing it, you're going to be able to it, it'll hold up pretty well. Um, I don't think I've ever had anything pull it down um, in the many years that I've been using it. So it's called Horta Nova netting. It's, it's a professional grade um, trellis material uh, for agriculture. So it's, it's pretty sturdy stuff. Um, so for any of these you want, you know, you want your T posts at the end and then um, you want to space them every five to eight feet. So you can get up to eight feet if it's going to be kind of a lighter plant, like maybe you're, um, if you have pole beans that are, or like um, peas or something that are not going to create really heavy fruit, you know, you could probably get away with that eight foot spacing. But I'd say in most cases you want to do like a five foot spacing. Um, that's really going to be optimal in terms of like, you know, spreading out your, your T-post resources because the T-posts are kind of expensive. Um, so you get that's kind of you know the the trade off between distance and 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 strength basically um, five feet is probably your your Goldilocks spot um, yeah so tomatoes I wouldn't do more than five feet basically because those plants do get heavy and then with tomatoes um, and I have another video up on YouTube uh, tomatoes you don't necessarily need to use the the netting um, on them. Uh, you can, but you actually like like cucumbers and beans, they will actually grow, th they'll weave themselves, they'll grow through the netting just fine, but tomatoes won't, you'll actually have to train them into the netting and because you're kind of having to bend the plants into the squares, you run the risk of just snapping the top of the plants off so that's not great. Um, but we have another method um, of trellising tomatoes. So you don't need to install the netting for tomatoes is basically what I'm trying to say. And you can just plant, you put the T-post in, plant your plants, and then you let them grow until they're about a foot tall. And then you start on this thing called what's called the Florida weave. And um, I guess because Florida grows a lot of our tomatoes and this is a, a technique um, used down there. I guess that's why it's called the Florida weave. Um, it's kind of a funny name. But anyway, so you're basically using twine to build the trellis around the plants as they grow. So as the plants grow, you add more twine on either side of the T post. And basically you're just sandwiching the tomatoes in with twine. And like one strand of twine isn't gonna hold your plants up, but because you've got like five or six strands every six inches or so, um, you know, that's really gonna stabilize your plants. And I mean, you can get this, you know, as tall as your trellis is, so five or six feet up in the air. Um, by basically building this trellis around there. So it works pretty well. It's a little complicated. We'll we'll have a video on our YouTube channel about um, how to do the Florida weave and really explain it. Um, and it works really well. And, you know, there are farms that are thousands of acres of tomatoes that are using this method to hold their tomatoes up. So it can be done very quickly um, once you know how to do it. And it's a pretty efficient way to get your tomatoes up off the ground. So. Um, I get complaints about it every year. People say, this doesn't work. And I can honestly say, you're probably not doing it correctly if you think it doesn't work, because it definitely works. Um, but it can be a little tricky to figure out, but we'll do our best to get videos up there um, so that you can see um, how the method works and so that you can build your build it properly. Um, it is important to keep up with, you know, if your tomato plants get too tall and you don't keep up with the, um, 
with the trellis around them, then they will flop over and there's a chance that the, the plant will actually snap off um, so if it gets too heavy. So you want to you want to be out there every week and putting up another twine. Um, so Florida weave, we'll do more on that when it comes when it's a little more timely. Um, OK, any questions? Okay, I use cheaper landscape fabric and it disintegrated. Yeah, that's unfortunately the problem. Um, you get what you pay for. Uh, yes, and you got the five ounce fabric. That's the professional grade is the five ounce fabric. And usually it's rated um, for at least three years. So if you take care of it, um, yes. Is trellising better than using tomato cages? I think tomato cages honestly are fairly useless. They are too small um, for tomatoes. And generally, I mean, if you have a, Okay, so there's two kinds of tomatoes, not to get too technical, but there are determinate tomatoes and that just means that they get to a certain height and they stop growing. Um, and then there are indeterminate tomatoes and that just means they will grow until something kills them um, and they will continue to produce. So the determinate tomatoes um, stop producing once they hit that set point. Um, and, and that's nice if you're canning because if, you're, if you wanna can a bunch of tomatoes, you can plant determinate tomatoes and they will all basically produce fruit and stop growing around the same time. So you can harvest all your tomatoes at once and can them. Um, but most of us love heirloom tomatoes and we love eating tomatoes for the whole summer. So we wanna plant those indeterminates and those are gonna keep growing and they are gonna get far too large for those tiny little tomato cages, bless them. Um, although I will say tomato cages are great for holding up peppers. So let's, rec let's call them pepper cages. And so I love using them on peppers. They're like the right height and the right stability to keep your big bell peppers upright and from falling over. So that's my advice on tomato cages. Um, they just are too small. Um, what about cedar wood chips for mulching? Um, I probably would not use cedar wood chips. Um, they, cedar is a has, has some pretty powerful um, natural chemicals in it. And I, uh, I don't know that I would spread that on my soil unless it had been um, rotting for, you know, at least three years, two or three years. Um, but other types of wood chips, probably you can get away with just a year of rotting. Um, okay. <clears throat> you can, oh, Kitty's got some advice for, for doing some emergency surgery on your tomatoes. <laughs> That sounds amazing. <laughs> um, yes, and and I often don't keep up with my trellising, and the tomatoes flop over, and I don't know. They just it's fine. It's whatever. Um, you do what you can <laughs> while you have the energy to do it. <laughs> I definitely had a lot more energy before I had a toddler. So anyway, that's where we're at. Um, this is just the best case scenario for you. It's not a um, a commandment. All right, I think this is our final topic for the evening. We are going to talk about watering and irrigation. Um, so you need a plan now before you plant anything for how to get water to your garden if you don't have one immediately available. Plants need <clears throat> one inch of water per week. Um, and then they will need an extra inch of water for every day above 90 degrees. And um, hopefully we won't have too many days above 90 degrees because those days are really terrible days um, in general. <laughs> um, so it really depends. Some, some summers, two summers ago, it was just 90 degrees for like three months and it was terrible. Um, and then last summer, even though it frosted really late, it was actually kind of a nice mild summer. Um, and so I think we only had two or three 90 degree days. So it was totally cool. But anyway, so the hot, if for every day that it is above 90 degrees in your garden, you will need to add another inch of water. So what is an inch of water um, look like? So an inch of water is two thirds of a gallon per square foot of garden. So if you have a 500 square foot garden, that means you need to put every week 330 gallons of water. So when I say you need a watering plan, um, don't expect that you're going to be able to carry 330 gallons of water to your garden in a five, you know, five gallons at a time. Um, you really need some method of delivering water to your garden um, that doesn't involve you carrying it. Um, so just keep that in mind. If people are like, I'm just going to carry buckets of water, you're going to need, a, it's going to be a lot of um, five gallon buckets if you're going to do it by hand. So um, 
However, um, you know, obviously it rains, so um, you don't necessarily need to supply, you know, 330 gallons of water or whatever your garden size is every week. If, you know, if it's raining regularly, um, I totally recommend that you get some, you know, you know, $5 little rain gauge from the hardware store and plop that out in the middle of your garden. Um, so that you can just see kind of on a general basis, you know, and just pick a day like Sunday or whatever to empty it out every week so that, you know, week to week, um, you know, how much water is coming down. So just pick a day to empty it. Um, and so you, you can just basically see at a glance, you know, how much water your garden is getting. Uh, you can also check um, precipitation totals. There's a website called Weather Underground and the website is wonderground.com. And you just want to find the tab that says calendar view and then, you know, obviously look up Johnson City or wherever you are, but this will give you um, and obviously this is for the past. It's not going to tell you the in the future how much rain we're going to get, but it'll tell you, you know, in any given week. Um, how much rain we got. So, you know, let's just say this was last week. We got what about. 0.3 so we got about a third of an inch of water so you know that you need to add another two-thirds of an inch of water um, to keep your plants happy and this is kind of a general overview of the whole area so it's not going to tell you specifically what your garden is so if there were like isolated showers um, you know a lot of our summer storms are like that it's going to rain like in your neighborhood but it's not raining elsewhere so that may not register on um, this kind of general uh, site. So really having that rain gauge in your garden, um, it's really gonna tell you what it's doing in your garden that week. Um, but it's it's good to have this website as a backup just to kind of see in general. Okay, so if this were last week, I and I, I would know, or this were this past week, I would know that I would need to water um, because they didn't get enough. Uh, so if you're gonna, there, are, I'm gonna talk about different options for watering. So um, at its most basic, you can just get one of these like five dollar little um, uh, hose um, watering, hand watering things, and um, you basically want to time how long it takes you to fill like a one gallon bucket, and that's or a five gallon bucket. That's gonna tell you um, what your flow rate is. So um, use a gentle setting like shower. You don't want to just like blast everything away um, if you hit it with like the jet stream. Um, and then you want to water at the roots. You don't want to spray your leaves down at all as much as you can. You really want to um, get water to the roots as much as possible. Um, and then water, if you are watering by hand, I would totally recommend that you get out there early in the morning um, and water your plants so that uh, the earlier in the day that you can water, the better. Um, even if that means that, you know, it's afternoon when you get home from work, you know, if you can water right then, that's better than watering later in the evening. Um, just the more water on leaves is going to cause is going to help disease spread fungal disease especially so the drier your leaves are on a regular basis um, the less fungal disease pressure you're going to have in your garden um, and that's part of the reason why i tell you to water you know two or three times a week and that's just kind of minimize the amount of water that's getting on your leaves obviously you can't prevent rain uh, from coming down but um, if it, we have a dry summer, you know, that can help prevent a lot of fungal diseases if you're being careful about how you water. Um, there is overhead irrigation. I think this costs 40 or 50 bucks. You can get one of these tripods and one of these um, uh, rotating impact sprinklers um, online or at a hardware store. They're pretty good. Um, I like to combine, if you're going to go with this route, I would combine this with a rain gauge in the middle of your garden just to kind of see how much it's it's going because you can't necessarily tell what the flow rate is on one of these things. Um, and I would run it for one to two hours, two or three times a week, um, depending on what that rain gauge tells you. And again, um, I would run this as early in the morning as you can because this is totally going to get all your leaves wet. Um, so watering before 10 a.m. Uh, is optimal and that'll give your plants time to dry before we hit the evening um, when so nighttime is not wet and cool nighttime weather is going to foster more disease growth um, so having dry plants going into the evening uh, is optimal for preventing disease and then um, if you want to get it early in the morning and you don't feel like well, you, you keep forgetting to do it, you can combine that with an auto timer on your spigot um, and then I'll turn it on. And some of them will even do like a 48 hour um, uh, timer. So you're not, so it's not going to come on every day. Um, so you can, you know, different prices. Um, 
find different mechanical or electronics um, uh, auto timers for your sprinkler. So that may be worthwhile if you keep forgetting to turn your water on and off at the appropriate times. Um, drip irrigation is the best. It's also the most expensive. Um, so, and it's it's more difficult to set up. A basic gardening kit that you can find online um, is going to run you probably at least 100 bucks, if not closer to 200 bucks. Um, but most of the equipment that you get is going to last you, um, you know, at least five years, if not longer. Uh, although the actual drip tape, the part that's going to be getting water to, directly to your plants, um, is probably going to need to be replaced every one to three years, depending on how well you take care of it. It's just thinner material and it punctures really easily. Uh, anytime you have a puncture hole in it, it's just going to spew water out of it. So um, you just need to keep an eye on it and, and take it in in the winter and take care of it. Um, drip tape will water the roots directly. There's no water coming up onto your leaves. So it's, and it's also the most efficient. Um, when you're spraying water out over your plants, a lot some of that is going to evaporate um, before it even hits your soil. So this reduces evaporation, so it actually will save you on your water bill over the long term. Again, it's probably best to be paired with an auto timer just to remember to turn it on and off. Um, and then depending on um, what kind of drip tape and the flow and your water pressure and all these different factors, and this is something that um, that whoever you buy your drip tape from um, can tell you, they can answer these questions for you about how long you need to run it every day in order to get one inch of water. Um, with the kit that I bought for my garden last year, it does say to run it one hour every day um, to deliver one inch of water. And so a lot of times I will run it for two or three hours, you know, um, two or three times a week just to kind of reduce. Uh, again, I don't like watering plants every day. I feel like it makes the plant root system very shallow. And so if you can consolidate your watering to two or three days, then your roots are gonna go deeper into the soil and you're gonna have better, healthier plants. Um, okay, again, if it's really hot, water your plants. <laughs> Mulch also helps to conserve water. Um, okay, yeah, these are just the basic watering tips that I've already covered. So that's the end of my presentation. And I'm, it's 7.30, I seem to talk a lot. So any last questions? Did you get a good use out of the Berry Hill drip irrigation? Yeah, I like the Berry Hill drip irrigation kit that I got. Um, I like it just fine. It does seem to be kind of cheaper than some of the other options and it's it's in Virginia. So I feel like it's a little more local than some of these other companies. Um, yes, and I will share this. I'll put it into the Dropbox file and I think Rosie can email out a link. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, so asking about timing um, for putting seeds into the ground, it, I will let you know, because um, some things like squash um, are very frost sensitive, so you don't want to put them in. Other things that we give out like beets and carrots and kale, um, onions, they can go in the ground immediately because they, they are more frost tolerant and so they don't care um, about colder weather. Um, but you want to, but summer crops um, like the squash and the cucumbers, um, I can't remember what else off the top of my head. Those are going to be frost sensitive and melons. You're going to want to make sure that um, there is no risk of more freezing temperatures. And really for summer crops, you want the te nighttime temperatures to be above um, 50 degrees. Uh, that's really your signal that it's time to plant summer crops. If you look at the 10 day forecast and you see that nighttime temperatures are consistently above 50 degrees, that is your signal to go ahead and plant your summer stuff. Um, Okay. Will we get an email if there was a problem with the seed order? Um, yeah, there's 50 of you. <laughs> so um, we, uh, Rosie, by, by we, I mean Rosie. <laughs> yeah. Rosie, bless her, um, is going to be compiling seed orders into a big spreadsheet. Um, and then we are going to be um, handing that over to some volunteers to get everyone's seed orders together. So if we do have some questions, um, we, we will, yes, we will ask you, but um, 
if we feel overwhelmed, we may just make decisions for you and apologize for it later. So there is that. And there's um, also just to point out something about that too, is like, you know, for some people that ordered big quantities of things, like we can't guarantee that you'll get those. Like we're going to try our best to get everybody what they want, but um, you know, there are 50 of you, so we will have to um, make decisions and all that. So just. Yeah, because I have to put I have to put these orders in in January, um, especially for the plants. I have to order them like 10 weeks in advance. So I have to do it before I know even how many people are going to be in the program. Um, so I'm just guessing. Um, so most of the time we have plenty of plants. We, we usually have leftovers of a bunch of stuff, too. Um, but things like broccoli especially is really popular. Um, and so I never can seem to order enough broccoli, even though I increase the number of trays that we buy every year. Um, so, um, but we will do our best, but if you get, and generally we will give you as many plants as you ask. It's just, if every, if, you know, we put all the numbers into the spreadsheet and we find out that, you know, we have 600 requests or six requests for 600 broccoli plants, but I only ordered 500 or whatever, then we have to, some people aren't going to get everything they request. Um, but anyway, we will do our best. Uh, okay, irrigation system, would it be best to bury the main line um, to the house to the garden in a PVC pipe? That's totally up to you. If you want to do that work of burying that line, um, that's probably great. Um, and that will um, probably prevent accidents like someone with a lawnmower just running over it and destroying that. Um, that's totally cool. Um, but it's not a requirement that you do it. Is it too late to start tomatoes from seed? No, um, they grow pretty quickly. Uh, I mean, you're not going to get them in the ground first thing in May if you start tomatoes now, but you can definitely um, get, you know, by mid-May, you probably have plants that are ready to go. Um, yeah, because we only provide, I mean, there's a bazillion different kinds of tomatoes out there, um, and we provide, I think, four varieties. Um, and granted, they're my four favorite varieties, so uh, you're getting Lexi's four favorite tomato varieties. But um, if you want your four favorite tomato varieties, you could, you still have time to start the seeds, totally. Um, um, I would generally, we probably won't just give you one. We will probably give you at least two plants, um, uh, it, just in that case. Um, so, uh, yeah, I generally recommend it ordering at least two, unless it's like the herbs um, that aren't basil. Basil, um, we get in large quantities, but things like the sage and the rosemary and thyme and lavender and whatever else we're giving, those are perennials. Uh, and they also get to be quite large. And so um, if you ask for more than like two or three of those, I'm probably gonna question you about it just um, because they will eventually produce a lot of plant material and you probably don't need more than two or three. Companion plants. Um, I kind of covered companion plants in the last workshop, which is basically by saying that diversity is great in your garden and that I think a lot of those charts that tell you that um, like tomatoes and carrots or whatever hate each other and don't plant them together. I think that's mostly hoodoo and it's not backed up by any kind of science. So um, yes, diversity is good, plant things together, um, but don't necessarily be terribly concerned about what is going together. Um, I'm gardening in raised beds and likely order to re meager amount. Well, that's okay. I mean, if you um, generally, if you stick around, if you come back at the end of the plant giveaway day um, and you feel like you, you look at the plants that you've got and you're like, this is not enough. If you come back at seven or whenever the planting day is done, um, we will give you more plants or sign up for a time slot that's towards the end of it. Um, and we'll kind of know what we've got left over and we can give you more. Um, oh, yeah, I think that um, there is a kind of a little companion planning cheat sheet, but again, I don't take it as gospel. <laughs> it's just whatever. Um, if I have raised beds, yes, you should get soil for them ASAP because um, plants are coming next Thursday. So if you can get soil in this weekend, um, you will won't want to do that. Um, otherwise, your plants are going to be sad. <laughs> Are there any flowers to avoid having near the garden? No, flowers are great. Um, I would avoid planting perennials in inside your garden, but um, if you have like an annual flower, that's actually great to put in your garden. Um, the more flowers, the better. Uh, flowers are basically 
food for beneficial insects most of the time. And so by having more flowers in and around and all over your yard, um, you're going to be attracting all the really good bugs in to your garden. And, and I'm going to talk more about this. I can't remember if we're doing pest or disease control first, but in May and June, we do pest and disease control um, one or the other. And I will talk more about attracting beneficial insects, but basically um, flowers are great to put flowers in and you want flowers of very of different sizes too. So you want big flowers and you want tiny flowers and you want simple flowers and complex flowers. So the more flowers you've got growing in your garden. Um, and I would say even, you know, five or 10% of your garden space should be devoted to flowering stuff um, just to kind of get that diversity of insect life into your garden. Bugs are good, most of them. <laughs> There's only a very limited number of bugs that are bad, um, and we will discuss those in great detail. Um, should we avoid planting fruit trees close to the veggie garden? Um, the only thing I would worry about fruit trees is if they are going to shade your garden. So um, you could put, I would keep any tall trees as much as possible, if you haven't planted them already, um, to the northern side of your garden. So, um, and then I wouldn't put them too, too close to the edge of the garden either, just because the tree roots are fairly aggressive at taking up water and nutrients. And so the tree roots will actually, if you're putting fertilizer and water into your garden, those tree roots are going to come straight for that. Um, and they're going to kind of put roots in your garden. Um, so uh, yeah, they're not that other. So the roots, I would worry about the roots and then I would worry about shading. Um, so I'd probably leave at least like 10 feet in between. Um, a fruit tree and your garden. And keep in mind that if you're putting in like a standard apple tree, that's going to get to be, you know, 30 or 40 feet tall and wide. So um, just keep in mind the mature and end result of that tree. Okay. My voice is still here. If there are more questions. <laughs> um, otherwise, we will get this up. Um, on to the drop or the Google Drive and we'll get stuff out to you as soon as we can. Great. Thank you all. I am uh, going to go and uh, drink some more tea. <laughs> <laughs> I have plenty of local honey. Listen, I have been trying so many um, home remedies for this darn thing. Um, <laughs> In fact, here's my honey. I was right next to me this whole time. <laughs> In case. Emergency honey. Um, okay. All right. Um, holler if you have any questions. Um, thanks so much for joining us again. We'll get the recording up and all that for you soon. So y'all have a good night.